Hey, you just tapped and drop in on one of the most amazing sermons on the net today. Welcome to CNBC. Get ready to have your spirit uplifted and prepare to dive into God's Word. Enjoy today's broadcast. It's good to see you all this morning. It's good to see some faces I haven't seen in a while. John and Deb, good to see you here. Dustin, good to see you, man. Digger and Joyce are back or to back hiding. Good to see you. We missed you guys. We really have. We're glad to have our folks starting to come back. I know as COVID has been real tough on churches. Uh, I got some statistics that you'll see in the newsletter that's coming out this month. What uh, Tom Rayner said is the predictions for the churches in the, in the next few years. Basically, he says that 20% of people will not come back that have left the church because of COVID. Uh, some will continue to listen by televised, but most of the folks just won't come back. And that's a shame because they're losing that opportunity of worship with their brothers and sisters in Christ. He also said that there would be a tremendous number of pastors who would resign from the pastorate in the next five years because of what COVID has caused. I know of two situations in our own association that that has been the case, that they've gotten completely out of the ministry. And that is really tough when you think about what is happening right now, since we believe that we're living in the end times. We need more preachers in the pulpit preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, because the coming of Christ is very soon. But this morning, I want to carry you on as we move forward to the cross in April, the time of Easter. We've been kind of progressing little by little. And if you'll turn to Matthew, the 26th chapter, Matthew 26, verses 36 through 46, we're going to talk about the most difficult prayer to pray. The most difficult prayer to pray. Starting in verse 36 of chapter 26 of Matthew, it says this, Then Jesus came with them to the place called Gethsemane. And he said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What, could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. And he came to his disciple and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. See, my betrayer is at hand. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, there was probably no time in history that the prayer that was being prayed was the most important prayer of our world. For it was a prayer of strengthening of the Son as He prepared to take upon himself the sins of the world. Father, I don't know how I would have faced that kind of prayer myself. But I know my Savior did. And I know that as he prayed, he prayed not only for himself, but for the world and for what he was about to do upon the cross. Let us get the full intent of that and understanding of that today as we look at your word. And let it touch our hearts and our lives and change us in such a way that we no longer would let anyone that we know of go one day without knowing who Jesus is. 
We ask for your blessings upon your word as it goes forth, changing hearts and lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, there's three gardens the Bible talks about. Eden, Gethsemane, and the one near the cross. Those gardens are important. Eden was one that we were kicked out of. But the Bible is actually moving us to the new Eden, which in Revelation is described as the new heaven and new earth. Once again, we'll be replaced from where we were to where we ought to be. That's what the term redemption means. It means to put back from where something had been taken. And we were taken from the garden, basically, because of our sin. But God, through His mercy, through Jesus Christ, is working to put us back into that relationship that we once had. One day, we will be able to talk with Him face in face as we did before. Right now, we can talk to Him through prayer. And we have that intermediary, which is standing before Him, our Savior, Jesus Christ. That when we pray, He doesn't see us, He sees His Son. Oh, what a powerful thing happened there on the cross. And what a powerful thing is replacing us back, redeeming us back into where we needed to be. C.S. Lewis said he had, saw two kinds of people, those who say to God, thy will be done, those whom God must say, have it your way. What kind of people are we? How do we find God's will? How did Jesus find the courage and strength to do God's will? We see it was a struggle for him, even as a human being, but even as divinity. You know, this prayer, as you'll see here in a moment, this prayer, which is the first point, demands a surrender in the soul. A surrender in the soul. Verse 38 says this, my soul, then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. I want you all to understand something. Jesus was not afraid of physical death. The torment that was in his heart and in his mind was because of the spiritual agony that the cross was going to bring. I studied into that, you know, let this cup pass from me. I've always wondered how he could say that when he knew he was going to have to drink of it, but I didn't understand what the cup was. Let me give you some examples of what the cup is, because they're uh, spoken of in the Old Testament. Let me share with you Psalms, the passage here in Psalms 75, when it says in verse 8, for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup. The wine is red, it is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely its dredges shall all the wicked of the earth drink and drain down. Another passage about the cup is here. Well, you see, this is the cup that Jesus was about to drink. Over in Isaiah chapter 51, verse 17, it says, Awake, awake, stand, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. You have drunk the dredges of the cup of trembling and drained it out. In verses 20 through 21 of the same chapter, it says, Your sons have fainted. They lie in the head of the, all the streets like an antelope in a net. They are full of the fury of the Lord, the rebuke of your God. Therefore, please hear this, you afflicted, and drunk not with wine, but from the cup. Over in Jeremiah, it says this in verse chapter 25, 15, For thus says the Lord God of Israel to me, Take this wine cup of fury from my hand and cause all of the nations to whom I send it, you to drink it, and they will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword I have sent among them. Folks, the cup is the cup of wrath that is poured out on sin. The cup Jesus was going to experience was the wrath of God on the sins of the world as he took them upon himself. That's why it, it turned dark. That's why the sun was blotted out. That's why the earth trembled and quaked. 
what Jesus was praying there was not because he was scared of the physical death, but he wanted the strength to bear the spiritual experience of God's wrath pouring out on a son who had never sinned. That was the struggle in the garden. Three times he prayed. Three times he entreated the Lord, Father, let me see your wrath. But in that prayer he also says, not my will, but thine be done. When you think about the cross, think about what Jesus really took upon himself. Your and my sin. The sin of the world, past, present, and future. That's why he prayed so fervently. And in one passage it says that he actually had drops of blood coming from his forehead. That's the anguish that Jesus dealt with. This prayer was one that took the strength that Jesus had to surrender his soul to God. This prayer, to pray it, demands a surrender of the will. You see, Jesus had a will. He could have chosen not to go to the cross. You realize that, don't you? As a human being, he had self-will. He could have chosen not to go. Woe be unto us if he had have, for we would have remained in our sins and would have felt the judgment for it. But he chose not his will, but God's will. What stubborn wills we have. We are born with these stubborn wills. Paul struggled with it in Romans 7, if you remember. He said, oh, the things that I should do, I do not. Those things I ought to do that I, that I do not, but the things that I should not do, those are the things that I do. Oh, woe is me. He struggled with it. You and I struggle with it every day. Choices that we have to make. Choices that sometimes are very difficult because of circumstances that we live in. It's not easy to make a choice. Yesterday I made a choice. I went out and I, I tilled the garden. I paid for it later. I paid for it as I was tilling. Our rooster doesn't like wheels. And that tiller has two wheels on it. And I didn't even see him behind me, but he got me in the back of the leg. He chose what happened to him afterwards. And the wrath of God fell. He did the same thing to my daughter. And I got tickled at what she did to him. She put him underneath the wheelbarrow and then took something and beat the wheelbarrow. Lifted up the wheelbarrow and he kind of lingered off, you know. We make choices, sometimes dumb ones. But folks, let me tell you something. The will of God should permeate our lives. Not our will, Lord, but yours. There are some choices that I've had to make that I've finally said, Lord, I just can't make this choice. You're going to have to show me which one. Because we are stubborn people. Particularly us that come from Missouri because we are called mule-headed. But the truth is, everyone has a stubborn streak in you. If you don't think you do, just ask your loved one, and they'll tell you for sure. So what do we do with this stubborn will? You know, both men and animals have stubborn wills. Try to lead a dog when he doesn't want to go anywhere. Don't even put a harness on a cat. They'll just drag. I'll just tell you right now. Bits in a horse's mouth are used to control their will. But even they reject that, don't they, Doc, from time to time? They have a stubborn will. Do you refuse to come to Christ because of your stubborn will? 
Have you refused to forgive because of your stubborn will? Yield to God and make His will your own. You will experience greater relief and peace. In yielding, you will find forgiveness and freedom. When we yield to the Lord, our will, things go a whole lot better. To pray this prayer demands dedication when others fail. Notice that three times or twice he had to go out and wake the disciples. Now, I'm kind of wondering, somebody must have been hearing something because it's written down here. One of them had to be somewhat awake. Matthew writes this, but I'm sure it was one of either Peter, James, or John that heard the things that Jesus said and related it to the other disciples. And that's how we get the record here. Because this is a verbatim. We used to have to do those when I worked in the hospital as a chaplain. You have to write down a verbatim after you visited with a patient as to what you said and what they said and what you said and what they said. And I always wondered, why in the world did we have to do that? And turn it over to the head chaplain. He said, well, he said, I turned it over to the nursing staff and the doctors and they are able to ascertain from what they tell us and what we say exactly what their spiritual and physical condition is. I said, really? Yes, because a lot of times they talk to us where they won't talk to the doctor. So that's why we wrote verbatims. Sometimes we talk to strangers quicker than we do friends. I remember one time my wife was meeting with uh, one of her friends and she invited me along for the lunch. And she told me afterwards, she said, that woman talked to you more than she's ever talked to me. I was a stranger. Isn't it interesting how we relate to other people? You see, we're supposed to relate to God like that. We're supposed to tell him our everything. And you know why? He already knows our everything. But when we talk to him about it, it's confessing. And it brings us in right relationship with him. Pray this prayer demands dedication when others fail. The disciples had failed to stay awake. Do you have trouble uh, staying awake when you're reading your devotions at night? Do you have trouble hearing God? Are things getting in the way? I took a communication class one time and it learned that in between the speaker and the listener, there is this field of static. It has to do with our bias, our understanding of the word, our understanding of what's going on, our understanding of that person's feelings. All of that works into that bias or that static. And so sometimes what we hear is not what is being said. So we have to be careful about hearing and listening. We've got to sort out some of that stuff. And it's good sometimes to say to that person, I didn't hear you correctly. Would you repeat what you said? Because you see, there's all kinds of distractions sometimes when we're talking. Jesus was not distracted when he was praying. The disciples were distracted because they were tired. And as he said, the spirit was willing. They came at his call, but the flesh is weak. Did you ever have that times in your life? When the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And it's because we've made our times and our culture so busy. We are busy doing busy work and not taking time to be in communication with the master. We must remain faithful to him when others around us fail. Some questions you need to ask yourself. Have you been resisting the will of God in your life? Think about that. Have you been resisting the will of God in your life? I can't answer that for you. I know there are times when I have resisted the will of God. I know that there are times when I have been stubbornly resisting the will of God. How about you? Have you resisted that will? Are you willing to surrender 
all. You know, when you give your heart and life to Jesus Christ, he's not asking for just a part of it. He's not asking for just your toes or your feet or your arms or your head. He wants you all, every part of you. He wants every sin to be dealt with. He wants every area of your life to be placed into his hands. He doesn't want part of you. He wants all of you. I've heard some Baptists say, oh, I don't like to see people raise their hands. Let me tell you something. Raising the hands means surrender to God. Giving Him praise and giving Him surrender. Surrendering to Him. Here I am, Lord. Take me, all of me, and use me to your will. Have you surrendered your all to Him? You can come to the one who has surrendered all for you. His name is Jesus. We're going to give you a moment or so to make that decision. We want you to know who Jesus is. We want you to know that he can change your heart and life. Now, I'm not one who can save you. Only Jesus can. This church can't save you. Only Jesus can. Getting baptized can't save you. Only Jesus can save you. And to do that, you got to give him your all. That's why it says, If thou shalt confess with thine mouth and believe in thine heart that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thanks for joining us here today. We hope that you enjoyed the message and it made an impact in your life. Hey, you want to make sure and visit with us on the web at mycmbc.us. Also, be sure to stop by our Facebook page and follow the ministry of Crow Mountain Baptist Church. You can find it at facebook.com forward slash Crow Mountain Baptist. Tune in next week for another amazing message. Have a great week. Thank you.